Okay. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adrian Ellis, and I'm the moderator of this panel. And uh, we shall be as concise and as to the point as we can be and try and uh, uh, save a little time. But it's a fascinating and it's a vast topic. Our subject is the role of creative assets as engines of prosperity and growth. And as you heard from uh, Catherine, a Europe powered by culture, and as you heard from Sir Howard this morning about the story of Manchester, um, it would indeed appear that um, uh, uh, cultural assets are increasingly central in economic and social uh, development. Now, if you think through, back through the whole arc of history, that would have been seen as a, a, a surprisingly um, uh, um, uh, counterintuitive statement. In fact, I think that um, if you'd thought about the uh, apex of Greek civilization or of Roman civilization, or if you'd thought about the um, uh, the Italian Renaissance, or the, or the English Enlightenment, or the French Enlightenment, or even the Gilded Age at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries in America, you would have been more likely to see the role of um, uh, prosperity and growth in the, um, uh, as an engine for, for cultural, um, uh, cultural renaissance. In other words, we are increasingly um, aware of a line of causation that goes not from economy and society to culture, but from culture to economy and society. And that's really only in the last 20 years or so that those lines of argument have, 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 have developed. And when they started, uh, they were um, uh, treated with a certain amount of uh, fastidious uh, skepticism by, by many. I remember early economic impact analyses about the economic impact of the arts, which have been talked about a great deal over the last uh, uh, two days in, in context of cultural tourism and in the context of uh, regeneration and so forth. Uh, most economists were deeply skeptical about the choice of multipliers. They were deeply skeptical about um, uh, the, the uh, displacement effect. Uh, I remember one um, very distinguished economist um, uh, with, uh, who gave a very um, incisive lecture on the methodologies of economic impact and pointed out that you know jobs were created by shoveling money out of helicopters too. So. Um, uh, the, uh, the climate has changed, uh, and I think it's really because, uh, in practice, it's clear that policymakers have found culture to have a role. And as the um, academic arguments have moved along in some ways in parallel with a growing awareness that um, investment in different forms of culture, both in capital and in operations, in formal, in informal, and in a broader definition of culture that includes sport, that includes um, uh, uh, entertainment, that includes uh, creative industries, there is clearly a significant uh, impact. And that is what we are here to explore this afternoon. And we have um, exactly the right panel for those purposes, because we have some policy wonks in the form of uh, Sarah Selwood and in the form of uh, 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 Ian, um, both of whom have deep knowledge of um, uh, uh, the, both uh, the, the policy context and the supporting academic literature. Um, we have Tama Padel, who is at the sharp end of raising significant sums of money and knowing what it is to which um, uh, 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 philanthropists and others respond. Um, uh, Yorgos and Christos um, have a uh, mainland European perspective, both from Greece and France, and uh, a perspective as practitioners and, importantly, as people with um, a, 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 an artistic perspective, because one of the other interesting tensions in all this, or, or lines of discussion, is that as these instrumental arguments have grown and developed over the last 20 years to a, a significant point of, of, of um, uh, uh, relevance in policy decisions, um, there are those who ask, yeah, but aren't you missing the point? Isn't culture about culture? And isn't culture an end in itself? And don't these instrumental arguments in some way trivialize and undermine the underlying case? Well, uh, no, uh, that's what we're here to explore today. So I'd like to start off, if I could, with um, Ian and Sarah in, in any order. And what I want to ask is, is it true, at its simplest, that uh, intelligent investment in, um, uh, in culture uh, has a positive impact on um, uh, our, our economic and social impact, and um, what then constitutes intelligent investment? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, 
Can you hear me? Oh, hello. So uh, I'm Ian David Moss. I'm a um, uh, research director for an organization uh, based in the United States called Fractured Atlas, um, and uh, I also write a blog called uh, Create Equity. So I um, recommend everybody read. It is um, the um, key blog on many of these issues. So a plug. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so in response to the question, uh, the evidence from the uh, from the research literature uh, on the arts and, and economic and social impact um, uh, implies that uh, there, there is a relationship um, between, uh, between the arts um, and, uh, and economic development in general, particularly when you look at it through the lens of real estate asset development, so, um, which is actually not the most common lens through which to look at it. Uh, people tend to think about it more in terms of jobs, or um, in terms of dollars being contributed to the economy in general. But actually, the, the strongest evidence that's out there um, points to, in, at least in terms of a causal relationship between um, a concentration of arts assets, creative assets in a place, um, points to the, uh, uh, the subsequent development of, um, of land values, of property values um, in, that, in that area. Um, and, uh, and so there's, uh, uh, there's been a, a decent amount of, of literature looking at this, um, and two of our earlier speakers today actually, Mark Stern and, and Susan Seifert, have actually done some of the best work um, on this. And uh, I really, if you're interested in this topic, I really encourage you to, um, to give their work a closer look. Um, so, so that is a fact, or that is at least a, um, something that, that I think a reasonable person can, can, can feel fairly confident about, um, that that relationship is there. Um, however, there's a big difference between uh, sort of having a, make, making a claim or making a statement that um, the arts are great, and by the way, uh, they contribute positively to the economy, and an alternative statement which says that uh, the arts are the solution or the answer to making the economy stronger. Um, the latter is a much uh, more ambitious claim to make. Um, and as Adrian was alluding to, uh, even if it is the case that the arts uh, do have a, a positive economic impact, there are lots of things. Almost everything, in fact, has a positive uh, economic impact. So do sports, uh, so do so does transportation, um, so do divorce lawyers, uh, so does the illegal drug trade. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily that special to say uh, that the arts have such and such, um, you know, an economic impact. And what we actually know much less about from a research perspective is how do the arts compare? How do the arts compare to other types of investments that one could make in the economy um, if you are in the position of, let's say, a foundation or a government um, to where you have a finite amount of resources and you want to grow the economy um, as strongly as you can, where do the arts uh, fit into that mix? And so there is uh, there's a really great research opportunity that has, uh, I think, to date been untapped uh, for the most part um, in terms of looking at the arts comparatively uh, um, across, you know, and not just, not just limiting the inquiry to the arts or to the creative industries um, specifically. And the final thing that I would say on that is that I think the implication from that line of logic is that uh, it's really important for policymakers um, and people making these kinds of investments and allocations of finite resources to have a clear sense in mind of what, what well-being means um, in order to have a sense of where culture fits into that. Because if one defines it as more of a, um, a kind of economically focused, in, in a more economically focused way, that might lead one to make different decisions about the role um, and place of arts and culture within that than if one uh, defines well-being in a different way. Sorry, you're the editor of Cultural Trends, which is uh, one of the reputable and fastidious of um, journals dealing with the interface between culture and policy. What's your line? Well, I think, I 
think Ian has already given you a fantastically full and um, solid answer, and I don't particularly want to repeat some of it, though I might want to embellish some. For instance, we have a chain of uh, greengrocers in England called Waitrose. We now talk about the Waitrose effect in terms of raising house prices in our, in our radius around Waitrose. So I think, I think your answer is right that anything can, can begin to increase house prices. I think what's important is if you look at the history of those cities where there has been considerable investment in kind of in culture and think about what that's done in the long run. And two spring to mind. One is Baltimore, which was one of the earliest um, examples of city where culture was invested, I guess, in the 1970s, 80s, after the kind of industrial decline in Baltimore. It seemed to me, and you may get me, uh, you may correct me, Adrian, that it peaked and I then it went, that. it kind of went right down again. Um, so there are, there are issues about how long that kind of investment and those kinds of institutions are sustainable for, and which begs the question of what do they need to be both more resilient and more sustainable. Secondly, if you look at British cities, Newcastle on Tyne is a really good example. Newcastle in the, I guess, the 1960s onwards was kind of hit by decline of mining, hit by the loss of the shipbuilding industry, certainly in terms of the employment figures for the 19, late 1960s, early 70s, had one of the lowest employment rates in the country. Newcastle attracted, for those reasons, um, lots of European money. It had social money from Europe, it had money to kind of rebuild infrastructures, and the cultural investment to Newcastle came at the very end of that. So we now talk about Newcastle and Gateshead. We talk about the sage in Gateshead. We talk about the enormous um, culture uh, attendances, maybe not so much, but certainly cultural investment um, in the arts in Newcastle. But what we forget is that that only comes at the very end of 30 years worth of investment in both socialist, social concerns and kind of infrastructure. And we like to think, and indeed the Arts Council of England will always talk about how the investment in culture in Newcastle kind of led the way to everything else, but in fact, um, frankly, that's advocacy, and if you look at the history of it, it's completely the other way around. So I think we need to think about those quite carefully, and we need to consider the context, the circumstances, and the time scale within which all this functions. So let me ask you, Katie, a question. Uh, Katie Dixon, as well as um, uh, being a director of special projects at BAM, at which uh, uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, which also has a um, fascinating cultural district, um, Katie had a bird's eye view of New York's cultural strategy um, under the Bloomberg administration as chief of staff for the very active uh, um, uh, uh, commissioner for, for cultural affairs. We tend to talk about culture as if it's an undifferentiated glob. In other words, a dollar on culture is the same thing wherever. But of course it's not. There are different forms of culture there are different forms of investment in culture, capital, operating, programs, individual artists, infrastructure, etc. So um, tell us a little about the intelligent part of intelligent investment from the point of view of New York uh, and how um, a, a city which has a diverse economy but also an economy which is critically dependent on its cultural offer both in terms of, of tourism and also in terms of the creative industries that offer some sort of complement to, to finance, real estate, etc. Um, what was the strategy and did it work? Um, thank you, Adrian. That's a great entree to talk about the incredible amount of investment that New York has made in the last decade. And it has uh, happened in several different ways with very clear strategies, although they might not have always been articulated in the particular way. You could see the policy in the way the money was spent. And in the last uh, 10 years under the Bloomberg administration, over $2 billion was invested in capital upgrades, new facility development, building projects citywide in all five boroughs, hundreds of projects. I think the total was somewhere around 500 different projects that received this investment. 
And the strategy was really one uh, that treated these cultural facilities as infrastructure. So in the same way that New York invests in its sewage system and its sidewalks in creating new parkland and public space, it created these public amenities in the form of cultural facilities that require intense amount of investment for particular kinds of spaces. Um, theater requires a particular ways of working depending on what you're doing. Dance rehearsal studios need um, space that is column free and has certain ceiling heights. And these are the kinds of investments that can be expensive and hard to make. But New York City, I would say somewhat quietly, made this consistent and intense, robust investment over a concentrated period of time when they were able to begin and complete hundreds of projects, which will make a, have made and will make a very substantial change in the, the platform that has been created for the creation of work. And um, New York also has a fairly robust um, spending uh, in program uh, investments and uh, has about 1,100 different organizations that are funded every year for um, all sorts of programming. And we have a um, panel system of peer review that makes the decisions about how the funding is allocated. Uh, but it's uh, between 30 and $35 million every year. And I would say the third prong in New York that has been really crucial to the development of the city for the last several hundred years is uh, the commitment to public ownership of its major institutions. Uh, you may not know that the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Carnegie Hall, the Museum of Natural History, my institution, BAM, all of those facilities are owned by the city and they also receive a dedicated operating support that it goes to uh, its general operating support, so it's not for anything specific. It supports the maintenance of facilities, it supports the uh, maintenance staff and security. Um, but that annual commitment at a very baseline to supporting those institutions um, has been crucial to the way New York has developed as a cultural center of the, the United States and the world. Yorgos, does this drive me mad? Uh, in other words, um, uh, so much of the debate around culture uh, in, in public life and the role of philanthropy appears to be about cause and effect and is unrelated or tangentially related to the quality of the art itself and the role of the, uh, and the intrinsic merit of that art. Do you feel that over time we're doing a disservice to what uh, you and your colleagues devote their lives to? Well, first of all, I want to answer on history. You know, all this idea about economy and cultural investments and all of that is something that came very late. It's many people started doing it without knowing what the effect was going to be. I mean, when in 1947, Jean Villard, who was a great theater director and actor in France, decided to go for a week down to the south with some actors just for holidays and maybe do some performances, he definitely didn't know he was going to create one of the major institutions of Europe for theater. The little town they went was Avignon. The success was so big, since then it's one of the, it, it, probably the biggest theater festival. All the other cities in Provence created a festival. Aix-en-Provence created an opera festival. Arles created a photography festival. And Provence became the number one destination for tourists. So the economy changed immediately. That also happened in other places with other political regimes for other reasons but sometimes with the same success. Of course, those that did not have success appeared one year and disappeared the year after, so I don't even know about it. But let, let me tell you that 71 years ago, before 1947, 1971, uh, a very good musician, not as well known as now, Wolfgang Wagner, had many, many money problems. And Emil Heckel, who was a friend of him, said, why don't we do the Friends of Wagner? Nobody knew about that. The idea of sponsors, I think, didn't exist. So they went from Leipzig to Frankfurt, from Berlin to everywhere, find some money. Then he decided to go and maybe organize a festival. He thought first of Nuremberg, then of Munich, and then finally they went to Bayreuth, which was a small village that nobody knew about. Everybody knows about. And since, you know, so many years, it's a center, touristic, economically very, very successful. So that happened several times, sometimes not always with a success. I mean, in 39, Louis Lumiere, which was one of the two Lumiere brothers, who invented cinema, decided to go to a small village in Côte d'Azur that nobody knew about, and maybe organize a film festival. <clears throat> the village was Cannes. It was 39. The war started, so he had to cancel it. Then after the war, they didn't have the money. They started in 48, and then in 49, didn't work. Started in 51, and since then, 
the festival made of Khan, one of the major places of Côte d'Azur, bringing money to all the area, you know, and it's a very successful thing. And the 48 was the same year as the Edinburgh Festival, a similar story. Yeah, absolutely. Edinburgh Festival, same thing. And Manchester, later, but same thing, yeah. Christos, your perspective. Well, I think one has to, you know, there's definitely a trend over the past, uh, the past few years, and I think one has to see it in a broader perspective, because there's nothing wrong, per se, in wanting to find out how cultural activities impact uh, the economy. There's nothing wrong, per se, on the contrary, in trying to uh, learn, as cultural organizations, how to be better managers and to make better use of funds, um, because all that is positive. However, I think one has to see this, uh, this trend within a, a much, more, much broader political um, uh, context, which uh, uh, I think a, a nice phrase uh, uh, in uh, Tony Judd's last uh, book, Ill Fares the Land, uh, which is you know, the withdrawal from the public uh, sphere, the withdrawal of, of, of interest uh, in, in the public sphere. Now, that, I think, is worrying uh, in a sense, uh, because uh, in many ways, one needs to, uh, one needs to make sure uh, that the kind of societies that we've grown up in, and uh, our generation, which have been very lucky, uh, I would say, overall, um, uh, in growing up, at least in Europe, uh, in, in broadly speaking, very democratic environments, very open, uh, very free. All these things depend on certain shared values, and the vehicle for these values uh, and the critical terrain on which these values have often been developed have been the arts. Uh, and so there's a very strong correlation between public interest in the very, very, very broad sense of democracy uh, and a lively artistic sphere that people can relate to as being their own arts as well. Arts and humanities. Arts and humanities, exactly. So I think what we're seeing is a certain withdrawal from anything that's not immediately perceptible as utilitarian. And in doing that, in fact, we're being very practically um, negative uh, in our approach to, to the kind of social environment that we really need uh, and have grown accustomed to and so used to it, we might, we might not even notice it anymore. But when you are, for example, and I, I want to bring Tamar into this as well, when you are looking out at the environment and seeking to secure funds, um, uh, do you feel that the need to um, uh, articulate a case that has metrics and accountability built into it um, is somehow uh, an affront? Or do you think it's integral to, um, uh, to uh, the process by which you learn whether you're spending your uh, funds intelligently? Well, I was yeah. either of you, both of okay. you. Tamar. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think uh, it was absolutely essential for us at Lincoln Center to have the uh, economic data and the economic impact in order for us to successfully raise $1.2 billion as part of what Katie was describing as a transformation of cultural facilities uh, and institutions in New York City. Um, if we didn't have that data, and if we didn't have the tools to um, articulate our cases for support, whether it was for a wealthy individual, a foundation, a corporation, um, or for the city or state uh, of New York, we would not have been successful. And I think it was absolutely imperative. And we, we had some good news to, to report. Yes, it was the kind of traditional metrics that we have to date, but we at Lincoln Center um, we're able to say that we generate $3.4 billion of economic activity for the New York metropolitan area. And we welcome 5 million visitors who have an economic impact combined of $660 million. Uh, the property values were, uh, is another measurement that you heard. Uh, and that also increased uh, and increased significantly uh, before Lincoln Center was built. It was uh, an area of slums. And uh, the property values have increased by an average of 8% a year, while the rest of Manhattan, um, those property values have only increased at an average of 5% a year. And we attract 5 million visitors annually. And the visitors themselves, while they do incremental spending in the city while they're there, it's important to know that they spend money not only on tickets, but they spend money on restaurants, on hotels, on transportation, shopping, as well as 
um, other activities, which is very important for the overall economic benefits in New York. Uh, there was, um, while we, we believe we at Lincoln Center are synonymous with world-class excellence in the arts and that the campus attracts the world's leading artists and ensembles, we really wouldn't be able to do that as effectively and as efficiently without the um, economic backbone, so to speak, about the importance and relevance of the 16 acres that we maintain in the middle of Manhattan. So, um, uh, there was an issue that was um, uh, alluded to in the earlier session, the workshop session on the um, uh, Stavros Niarchos Cultural Center, and it was also alluded to by Sir Howard this morning, which is that um, it's easier to raise money for capital generally than it is for operating. There's a sort of inverse relationship between the ease with which you can raise philanthropic and public funds and their utility in what you do. It's easier to raise money for capital than, uh, than um, operating. It's easier to raise money for new programs than old programs. It's easier to raise money for the marginal cost of new programs than the full cost of new programs. It's very difficult to raise money for bathrooms and cleaning them. So there's a sort of dilemma at the heart of, of, of a lot of this. But if one looks ahead, one sees that the sorts of successes that were associated with Bill Bow and are associated with um, uh, Lincoln Center and others, um, are, uh, uh, people are attempting to replicate that around the world. Um, my company did a piece of work about two years ago that, uh, for the British Council looking at um, capital investment in large-scale cultural projects around the world. The result was that over the next 10 to 15 years, there's approximately $220 billion worth of investment in infrastructure buildings around the world. Now, my question to you is, is that ultimately a negative sum game? In other words, is the world competing for cultural tourists in a way that um, uh, uh, ultimately um, sucks resources rather than creates this? Or is this the next renaissance of, of, of culture? Because that list is an astonishing list, and these aren't paper projects, these are things that are coming out of the ground. So who would like to answer that? Yes. <clears throat> I think it's the next thing, as you said. I think, first of all, all countries are different. Everybody can invest in a different way of culture and art and everything. Uh, I don't think here we do as much as we could do in Greece, for instance, because we have an amazing number of ancient you know, theaters and monuments that we don't really know which strategy we should ad adopt, we respect them. And you look at them like a cemetery, nobody approaches, instead we give them life and bring young people and work close to it and make music. And we do for the first time now, the festival, 26 performances in 26 theaters, but I didn't know a couple of months ago that it exists. And this is something that can help. I think in France they're doing a lot, in England they're doing a lot, and I think we can all do something like that. They start also in Asia, in places that nobody used to go to organize performances, bring orchestras and do music. And, you know, I don't think that one can, of course we will compete, but you're doing your festival, I'm doing my festival, and of course, as you said very well, they're going to New York to see this kind of performances, New York Philharmonic and Metropolitan Opera and all of that, and they would go to Manchester or elsewhere to do something different. And while capital campaigns are very attractive, they're exciting, they're sexy, they're fun, they're big, there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end, there's donor recognition, there's all of that, there's um, great excitement. I think for those organizations who do capital campaigns well, they will end up with a much stronger, much more robust, much more diverse base of funders if they do it right through the process. So that your donors will stay, will be excited about the programs that you are putting within those plazas, on those stages, and in those halls. Katie, you have a, uh, uh, a colleague in Karen who is regarded as one of the most redoubtable, along with Tamar, one of the most redoubtable fundraisers in the city. Um, what would her perspective be? And indeed, what is BAMS? Uh, well, I think that it, it, no money is easy to raise. And the, the capital money, as you say, Tamar, is a great um, uh, opportunity to build your community of supporters. Um, and. It, we're an equal opportunity fundee, and, and as Adrian mentioned, if some of you have encountered my boss, Karen, and, and uh, she is incredibly aggressive, as we are constantly at BAM about uh, fundraising, and we have so many different things that it's possible to fund on the operations side, from the 
you know, 123 different programs that we offer in any season, from kids' education to uh, senior cinema to the um, uh, Lyon Ballet. Uh, and, and in addition to that, um, we position ourselves as a community institution um, with the multiple offerings that we have and the constant activity that we have going on in our houses. Um, one of the important things that has contributed to our success and has contributed to um, our longevity and strength and growth is that we are a, an institution that plays a vital role in Brooklyn and an important role in civil society. And we are that third place for so many people. Um, we have a very strong brand. People expect to have a new and different experience when they come to BAM. I, I talk to friends all the time who say, I have no idea what I'm coming to see next week, but I'm coming to see something at BAM. What is it? And oftentimes they leave and they still have no idea what it was that they saw. But, but they, they keep coming back because we provide a different, exciting experience, a place to, to meet your friends, to experience new ideas. And that is really crucial to uh, driving us forward and, and to raising money. Um, I'd like to ask one more question and then open it up, up to the audience. My, uh, um, my question is this. At the same time as we're living in this golden age, it would appear, of investment in culture, um, there appear to be issues on the demand side of the equation. In other words, at that very same time, um, uh, if you look at long-term uh, data on audience attendance uh, for a lot of the higher end of culture, it would appear to be either s steady or declining. Uh, if you look at spend per um, individual audience member on marketing budgets and audience development, if you look at the priority given to attempting to uh, sustain uh, audiences, aging audiences, you would have the impression that you're living in a different world from the world of this, uh, uh, this conversation. Can you square those two? Can you explain why it is that at the same time that uh, many people in the arts are, feel very challenged about um, uh, the size of their audiences, we are at the same time celebrating this level of, um, uh, of investment? Uh, Ian. Sure. Uh, well, I, I, re you know, I represent an organization that works uh, with a lot of individual artists um, in the United States. Uh, we're sort of a, a nonprofit tech company, um, technology company that provides business, business tools um, for artists. Um, and uh, what we're seeing is that the, the, one of the kind of features of our time is that uh, it, it is, we're, we're sort of living in the age of entrepreneurship for the artists, uh, uh, for the artist. Artists were always entrepreneurs in a sense, but, um, but in the past uh, uh, recent decades, um, there's become much more of an awareness of, uh, of the need for, uh, for that. And when I say artists, I don't just mean individual people. Um, you know, we're, we're now also seeing uh, a, a you know, greater trend towards uh, small kind of loose collectives, uh, very small organizations that um, do projects with very little overhead and so forth. And we've seen an explosion in this, not just um, uh, you know, outside of the kind of formal nonprofit NGO structure, uh, but even within um, uh, the sort of uh, uh, space of nonprofits, there are more and more and more um, of these new entities forming, um, which I think is driven in large part because of uh, the the increase in graduates from uh, from perform visual and performing arts uh, programs. Um, that's a big driver of it. Uh, so the result of this, I think, is that uh, it, there's this perception of um, an incredible, amazing vitality, because it's true, um, of all of this, uh, uh, this creative activity taking place in our cities, um, in our cultural lives. It's incredibly vibrant. Um, but the, uh, it's, and so the choice, the amount of choice for consumers has increased a lot. Um, but it's not necessarily the case that there are, uh, that the kind of overall body of, of um, people supporting the arts, consumers of the arts, uh, is necessarily keeping up with that. And I think that the, um, some of the larger institutions uh, are finding themselves in a position where um, they're, having, they're having a lot more competition, uh, frankly, uh, among the rest of the um, 
uh, the kind of aspects of cultural life, and so um, uh, and so there's a lot of discussion about sort of how to stay relevant and uh, reach new audiences, reach more diverse audiences, and so forth. That is a kind of particular to um, institutions of a certain scale. So do you see? I, I'm gonna, do you see a process of rationalization ahead? In, in, in the private sector, if there's a mismatch between supply and demand, there's this horrible process known as rationalization, where capacity is taken out of the marketplace. Do you see that ahead? Um, I, to a certain extent, I do. Um, but I also would say that a lot of people expected a lot of big, major arts institutions to die. Um, when the Great Recession happened uh, in the United States, well, worldwide, um, but in the United States in particular, uh, in around you know 2008, 2009, etc., and it really didn't happen. There were a few, um, there were definitely a few organizations that uh, disappeared, went under, and so forth. But um, but nonprofits in general, maybe arts arts organizations in particular, I'm not sure. Um, but they're very resilient. They have a lot of resources at their disposal, and I don't just mean financial resources. Political resources. Um, too. Exactly. And so they have ways. You know, people people made it work. They made it work by cutting their expenses, by renegotiating contracts with unions, by um, kind of pulling out every trick in the kitchen sink, and um, and most of them were able to survive. Christopher. Well, I think audience development is, is obviously a key, a key issue. I mean, even for organizations that have assured funding and operational funding, um, you have to make sure that you're actually being relevant. And I think that means adapting to, to what the environment is. And I would identify two levels at which organizations have to do that. The first thing is that the art world itself has evolved tremendously over the past decades. Um, there are no longer these clear distinctions between genres. Uh, and, you know, everything is much more mixed, much more intermediate. So you, and the audience is used to that. Uh, there's no longer such an interest in pure disciplines. People right. are interested in a much wider variety of stimuli from, from the arts. And as an organization, you have to be aware of that kind of interest that's there. The second area in which I think organizations have to evolve is what their, what their role is, in fact. I think it's no longer the role of an arts organization just to present art. Uh, it's to be an active community player, I just think, as, uh, as Katie said. And that's, I think, um, becoming equally important. I mean, the role one has in education, the role one has within social organizations and communities of various kinds, at least from our perspective, um, is, is almost on a par with the significance of presenting a, a beautiful artwork. Uh, and that, I think, is something one has to come to terms with. Questions? We have an expert team, sir. Um, do you need a mic or project? I think nobody... We can hear you. <laughs> Go. Uh, declare who you are. <laughs> <laughs> or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Franco Becchis, uh, Foundation for the Environment and the uh, Turing School of Local Regulation. Uh, my question is about creating value. That is a serious thing. And I would suggest probably to be cautious in attaching real value to the increase in property prices, real estate prices, due to community phenomena. And uh, I'm interested in your opinion. And what about taxing real estate rents in order to finance a particular and focused initiative in the cultural field. Katie, I'm going to ask you to respond to that first um, in the light of the discussions we had last week on this topic. Sure. I, I think that uh, what we've seen at BAM uh, and as Brooklyn's um, fortunes have really risen around BAM, I think that it's very difficult to actually draw a causal relationship between our work explicitly and rising property values. Nor necessarily would we want to when we're talking to our community um, who have concerns about displacement and gentrification. And these are very um, uh, difficult issues uh, in New York in particular and all over the world. Um, but the, I the idea of how the contributors to economic prosperity capture the, uh, the the rising tide as, as, it, uh, as everything improves 
is a, is a great question and something that we're grappling with uh, in New York and neighborhoods all over. Um, many of you may be familiar with the High Line project um, that was developed in the, uh, the Chelsea uh, and, and Meatpacking District in New York. And there was a lot of talk about how to create potentially a, an improvement district around that uh, project that could capture some of the property uh, could place property taxes on some of these developments that were springing up unexpectedly. They, they planned, they anticipated that there would be some uh, positive effect from that, that project, but the, it was astronomical and, you know, just sort of exponential, the uh, economic effects and de development springing up all over the place and the, trying to figure out how you can tax those developments to maintain that park in perpetuity. And it was difficult to figure out because it wasn't in place before the project happened. In the cultural district around BAM, we are creating several new public spaces that are going to be, need to be maintained. And we're talking about putting a business improvement district in place that would impose a tax on the property owners in the area that goes back to the maintenance of the public space. Now, it doesn't create a special fund for the cultural facilities per se, but it does contribute to the funding that otherwise would have to come from the public or private sector um, to uh, maintain the public spaces that will be crucial to uh, outdoor performances and the, the success of that neighborhood. Um, I think other cities have looked at hotel taxes and, and other creative ways to, to do that, but it's, it's an important and excellent uh, thing to Does look at. Anyone else have a perspective on that specific question? Another question. No more questions? It's been a long day. <laughs> it has been a long day. <laughs> Do you want to use this opportunity to uh, catch up the, the time by a few minutes? Still? Yes. 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 Then I'm going to thank my panel. <laughs> uh,